to the fifth annual Guild of Music Supervisors State of Music in Media Conference. I'm Thomas Golovich, I'm the president of the Guild of Music Supervisors. Yay! First of all, thank you guys so much for coming out. I love this conference so much. It, it was sort of, you know, my dream as I was coming to the music supervisor to have a an educational platform that we could all kind of share and, and expand our community and, and touch upon subjects that are important to us and celebrate really great art and get a chance to have, you know, conversations with people that make it. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff that I really love here. Um, the work of the composer you're about to see is, I think, some of the greatest work in score today. I don't think that there is a composer I think is more exciting, uh, is doing more avant-garde work, um, and is doing stuff that is more uh, emotionally resident uh, than Hilder's work. Um, how many of you guys saw Chernobyl this year? Um, I, I don't know of a better, and I, look, I work on a really great show. I honestly think it's the best thing I saw on television this year. Um, Johan Rank, who is the director and, and sort of the lead creative owner, worked with us on Breaking Bad a long time ago. And he was a, uh, he was a rock star who basically shot some of his videos for his band and then started moving into commercials and other videos and started doing television. He did an episode for us on, I want to say, the first season of Breaking Bad, or maybe the second season of Breaking Bad. He had added so much to every moment. It felt like suddenly someone came in and found a whole other way of telling our story. And I feel like when you have an opportunity to have a story like Chernobyl, which impacts a lot of us, and I was alive and very present. I was in Europe when it happened. Um, it was a very powerful thing for everybody collectively. So I want to first bring out our composer. This is Hild I'm going to try this properly. Let's see if I can say this correctly. Hildur Gunnadon. Hi, thank you very much. Quite an introduction. <laughs> I, I am, I, like I said, I'm truly in awe of your work, and I feel like I've been watching it, you know, without even knowing it for a, a quite some time. Um, let's talk first about where you're from and a little bit about the world that you came from. Um, Iceland is a is a small country. I think it's uh, like six hundred thousand people. Half of that, three hundred thousand. <laughs> three hundred thousand. Well, three hundred twenty-five to be accurate. And the majority are in. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Ninety percent, I think, is the the, the head count in Reykjavik. And then, if you think about the number of iconic and astonishing artists, music artists that come from Iceland. I assume that this was a culture where you, did you all recognize of how much talent was coming up, or was there a sense of competition, or, or did you were you living kind of on your own little island? <laughs> well, yes, we were <laughs> definitely living on a little island. Um, I think the music community in Iceland, um, uh, well, at least when I was growing up, you know, I, I grew up kind of. Uh, pre-internet and um, at, in a time where there was only one airline in Iceland, so it was practically impossible to get out of the <laughs> out of the country. And um, you know, when you live in a place like that, you don't really have a lot of outside influence. Like if you, you know, you can like maybe get a record, like you know, the new thing, you know, every every three months or something, there's something new that happens. You're just like showing all your friends, you're like, oh my God, <laughs> have you heard that? So it was a very kind of closed community. And obviously, um, uh, so just so I kind of point to which generation I, I am of like, you know, my my friend, like my generation is like Sigurós and Moom and all of these fans that kind of, you know, came out of the band side of, of Iceland. And so we all grew up together and, and um, and we just didn't really have much to do other than play music because, you know, it's like, what are you going to do there? It's dark, you know, 20 hours of the day. <laughs> just like, um, <clears throat> so the community was very much just based on, you know, instead of hanging out and going to a bar, we just play music together or, or play music in a bar or, you know, so the, um, it was very, very supportive. And, uh, you know, every, and it was also at that time, you know, there was just like, a handful of amplifiers, you know, so everybody would be kind of using the same amplifiers. You'd be kind of calling someone, do you have that? Do you have the Fender that we used at the, you know, so was, and then somebody's grandma would come driving it over or something like this, you know, so it's like, it's a, it's a beautiful time to grow up. And, and um, 
And I think we all benefited a lot from from this, you know, deep and fun connection. So, so our way of making music was um, very inspired by, you know, curiosity and just, you know, using whatever we had at hand, you know, because of lack of gear, we just like kind of like, oh, I just use this, whatever. Like, do you play guitar? No, not really, but play it anyway, you know. So it's, that was kind of the <clears throat> always the drive, and I think it's it's um, and I think. Today it's it's still quite present because it's just always been the vibe there and it's always been kind of the vibe of of you know there was one airline and no one ever came to Iceland like no bands really came to tour in Iceland at that time for example so no one of us thought that anyone could ever make money out of you know making music so that was just like a, a, a dream that you know was just not it didn't reach us you know so we were just doing it for for each other really and. Um, and I think it's a, it's just it's a good vibe to to grow up in because I think it kind of it stayed with all of us and and, and it's um you know I think most of us from this generation we're still kind of driven by curiosity and and curiosity often takes you to places that you know are maybe unexpected hopefully because it you know you just you're you're learning a lot as you as you go along and and um, and that's just you know makes the work very exciting. No. And you think about the artists that came out of Iceland, they're so distinctive. I mean, we're starting obviously with Bjork and, and Sugar Cubes, and then we think about Johan Johansson, and we think about you know, Moon, you mentioned earlier. And what I love so much about the artists that came out of Iceland is that they all seem to be very unique, Sigurosis, obviously, like nothing else. And I think that it's so intriguing to have a place that is so small that has such individual uh, specificity. You know, it's not like there was one sound that came out of it, you know? You live in Berlin now, and if you think about the musicians that come out of Berlin, sometimes there's a consistency of it. <clears throat> Techno is huge in Berlin, so many artists are sort of influenced by it because they're going to clubs. It seems like you didn't have that option in Iceland. It was really experimentation and curiosity. How were you hearing other music? Like, was it a question of, or even film music? Like, how were you first exposed to that and had the uh, opportunity to explore it as something to actually do yourself? You mean film music? Uh, yeah. Um, well, I never, I, uh, I never really had any ambitions to become a film composer as such. I mean, I, um, I my fa like in my family, everyone is a musician, so music is like the normal thing to do in my family, and uh, so that's kind of just what I did because that was what everyone did, <laughs> and then um, I just you know kept on going and and um and I've always been I guess it's again the curiosity thing like I've never really wanted to be stuck in a box like I've never wanted to, like I don't really like genres so I, I don't um I don't want to be stuck in a genre of any kind so so I need to perform and I need to like you know have space to do lots of different um uh, different outlets and um to to aim to be only one type of composure just seemed very limiting to me and um, um, but I love storytelling and that's what really draws me to film and that's um, what I love so much about it um, and um, so I think my entry into film was actually kind of through theater because as I was as I was studying electroacoustic composition at the um, at the Arts Academy in Iceland, I um, I was I started to work in theater there, basically just like through through school, and so I, I started to do like bigger and bigger theater productions, and somehow it just seemed like a logical um, evolution to go from theater to film because it was just like another storytelling media, and um, so you know I've been doing film music for about 15 years or so. I think that's probably when I did my first feature film. And um, and it was mostly European productions. And, you know, I did one like every, you know, one a year or every two years or something. It was just like one of the things that I did as, you know, in between touring and, and um, all the other things. And um, somehow it just kind of escalated and, and uh, you know, the film projects started to take up more and more time and more and more space. And um, also kind of as I started to work more in film, I think I also just, um, I gained more trust from filmmakers because, um, you know, it's just kind of like, I guess it's like, it's um, films are, are such 
huge productions and there's so much at stake when when you're making a film and, and um, you know it takes a little time to earn earn people's trust to <laughs> to tamper with you know with with their um, with their babies and with their you know um, investments so um, but the last years like I guess as I just you know have I've been working more and more in that in that medium I've, I've also been gaining more trust so so I've been um, allowed to kind of go further and further in, into directions that really excite me more. And I've been allowed to kind of go a bit more um, into the experimental side of things. And, and um, so I've, I've kind of just followed that a bit as as, um, as that world is kind of, you know, I'm, I'm getting more more creative space. I'm just like, okay, well, I can, I can, stay, I can stay around for this. I can, you know, I can do more films, okay, if, I, <laughs> if I'm allowed to do this, you know. For example, in Chernobyl, you know, when um, we first came up with the idea to, to um, you know, we were like, I, th I think I think the only thing, the only right thing to do in this for the series is to turn like a, a nuclear, a nuclear power plant into a into a musical instrument. I think this would be the way to go. And they were like, <laughs> let's talk about your process for that because I remember when I watched it, it, it felt to me like um, a requiem but spoken from the point of view of the creature that had basically was perishing, you know? And it, it, it grew and got more expansive as the series went on. Tell me a little bit about how you approached that and, and how you recorded those extraordinary things, and that's your voice as well. Yeah, yeah, that's me singing. Um, so as I said, like we kind of st um, started the, the process with a really strong sense of like the, the space needed to like the space is such a big character of of the story like of what happened and the um and the space then kind of turns into radiation and the radiation is obviously you know one of the the biggest elements of of the series but the radiation is like an invisible force so you can't really you know you can't really film radiation but but uh, so this seems like it was important for the music to take on the role of of being the, the presence of radiation. And because the story, as you said also um, before, it, it just like it's an event that has affected so many people that are still alive and, you know, people that are uh, experiencing still some sort of like, you know, physical problems like, you know, thyroid problems or, or you know, what have you not because of, because of radiation and, and, you know, people that lost their families or, you know, just, and yeah, it's, it's like an event that really, really, had a big impact on so many people that are that are still alive today, and um, because of that, because of like it being so present, and because of the reality of, of these events, I just felt it was really important to be really honest about what happened, and not to kind of. I really did not want to, to dramatize anything that happened. I didn't want to, you know, I, I didn't want to. Um, Storming with thriller drums or drama strings to kind of you know over dramatize the emotions of what happened because what happened was like horrible enough like it's, it's more horrible than anything that you can imagine so I really wanted to for the audience to to um, experience what it felt to be there like what it what what the radiation like felt like sonically and when, what the, what the vastness of these uh, of this space sounded like and um, and therefore. I felt it was really important to to go there to the space to to capture actual sounds and have them play like um, you know a kind of center role of the music so the music could kind of be almost like factual. So um, so we went I went there with a my score producer is here in the in the audience and Slater I went there with him and and Chris Watson to um, to a power plant where the series is uh, filmed, which is in Lithuania, and it's a, um, exactly the same type of power plant as Chernobyl was, so it looks exactly the same, and therefore like has like very similar machinery and, and therefore sounds almost identical to how Chernobyl would have sounded like. So we went there to to just capture the, the power plant sonically, and, and we went there to to just like listen to um, to what it sounded like. and. Um, we were like very clear that we didn't want to like go in and like bang on things or like make any like make anything sound anything else than what it was, and um, so it was very kind of driven with um, just the curiosity of listening and listening was the center 
it was the center kind of force of the whole process. It was just to listen, how does this sound like? And we listen to how it feels to be there and how it feels, feels to walk through these like kilometers and kilometers of corridors and just like be in these vast spaces. And and, and then, um, so we took those recordings and, and spent, you know, months and months kind of digging through them and processing them and stressing them out and bringing elements that were, you know, inaudible down to an audible range and, and then, you know, um, like this, for example, this this melody is um, is like the kind of centerpiece of the melody it comes from a, a melody that um, that came from a door that was leading up to a pump room. So that was kind of the the, the biggest solo musician of the score was this door. To, yeah. <laughs> so this door just happened to uh, to be creating like a symphony of, of sounds. It was really really quite incredible. This door. That door's had an incredible career since then. Too. Yes. <laughs> It's a world famous door. And, and, uh, yeah, so the so there was this like little uh, little bits and pieces of melodies that it was that it was making, but like incredibly, incredibly high. So so I like pitched it down, and then you know it, I took motifs that the door was was uh, was singing and uh, and you know sang that myself and and turned it into into this piece, which is a uh, yeah. One of the things that I find so um, poetic about the piece as a whole is the restraint that every department seemed to have. And you know, Johann's choices, everything from the authenticity of the costumes, which I'm still in awe of because I was in Eastern Europe in similar time periods and people wore those clothes. Those cars are accurate. Um, and your score is also so wonderfully restrained and invisible but emotionally poignant. It's kind of like you mentioned the radiation. It just blows up. I'm just curious about the kind of directives he might have given you or how your correspondence with, with him and other members of the, of the team as you were building. Did you have to dial things back or did you guys kind of arrive at the same place? Um, well, Johan is Swedish. Uh, so we share kind of very similar aesthetics uh, uh, about not um, not overloading um, overloading anything that doesn't need to be you know not saying anything that doesn't need to be said you know and, and, and that that's like the point that we were um, we, we yeah we were really uh, we really agreed on and we kind of just decided to really stick to that the whole the whole time and it was um, and I think with a, well, like I said before like with a story like this I think it's just um, um, I think it's important that the story just really is allowed to stand on its own, you know, because it's it's um, um, a lot of filmmaking, especially kind of commercial filmmaking today, is 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 so much about like spoon feeding, and um, it's I just I think it's like it's just kind of speaking down to the audience, not like allowing them space to to decide for themselves. Like, you know what they what they feel about the situation and what to they find the right answer. Yeah, exactly, and just be you know be allowed. It's like the the difference between, for example, like reading a book and and watching a film is, of course, that like you you are kind of you know have so much space. Like when you're reading, you have so much space to just imagine, you know, the scenario and and you know how how you imagine how a person is feeling and and. I think you should be allowed that space in film also to some extent. Like I think you should like you need to have um, to to really kind of or at least that's for for uh, for me personally. Like I experience I get more emotional reaction from films if I'm given a little bit more space to kind of process how I feel about it instead of constantly being told how to feel. You know, and it just it's it's um, it's just much more satisfying to me. So I try to. I try to bring that approach into projects that I work on. You know, it's it's uh, um, you know just because I I experience those those platforms like that myself, and and also I just I feel <clears throat> as a um, as a composer and as a musician, I think um, you know the more kind of space you have for each music cue, the more impact it's allowed to have. Because if you have constant music through. So like you have like you know eighty seven minutes of music in a ninety minute film. It's just like each fatigue. Yeah, exactly. It's just like everything blends together, and you're not you're not allowed to kind of you you just don't have the space to really kind of step in and and just like you know make a big statement because you just you know it's uh, there's no space for it. Yeah. So um, yeah, that's something that I that I really do try to 
bring into every project that I, that I work on, just like, you know, they have be given space, you know. And, and I know it's also yeah. that you seem to have extra beats in a weird way, which is really nice. It feels like you're giving the audience space to come up and meet you. And I feel like that's one of the things, what drives me nuts on, on when I'm looking through temp on projects is how frequently it's like immediately the music is telling you how to feel. You don't get a moment to get there. And in a way, there's something so nice about framing things upon the timing of the characters, and especially with Chernobyl, which is everyone is coming to a late realization of how extreme the circumstances, how bad it is, that in a way, allowing the audience to come to that same conclusion has even more impact. I don't know if you recall the process for a scene like this, but were you given any direction on these, or were you just given the canvas and basically given an opportunity to paint it as you wished? Well, this, funnily, uh, funny that this scene was chosen, because it's actually the only scene that was not scored to picture. Ah, <laughs> so it's an, it's an older track of mine that's taken from uh, one of my solo records. Ah. So it's, yeah, it's the only, it's the only time in the series that, um, that we have any um, instruments. And uh, it's the only time that, um, so my voice is basically like, um, the only instrument that's used in the score, and that was kind of the, the human connection and the emotional connection, to, and which was a very important, obviously, part of the of the story as well. And um, uh, this scene somehow just it really required um, a kind of total because, like up until now, we've we've just um, you know really been in, in radioactive in the radioactive world, and it's been kind of quite cold and um, uh, yeah, kind of just like dis distant and, and uh, threatening often. And um, it felt like at this point, you know, when when we um, connected the story with, you know, with, with Ludmilla having the, the child and the kind of really connecting to the um, the sacrifice that the people had to, had to make, you know, these, uh, these soldiers. And, and uh, it just felt like a good point to really take a shift and, and go to, to something completely different and have, like, actual instruments come in and kind of bring it a little bit into, um, even more into the human world than out of the radioactivity. Was this the piece that introduced Johan to your work? And, and was this something that they had placed in there at some point? Or was this the decision that was made during the production process? Uh, yeah, no, it was during the production process that this uh, that this piece came in, and I'm not sure if uh, I mean I knew that like both Craig, the writer, and Johan and, and all of them knew. I think they knew all my records, so I think it's just one of the pieces that was that yeah, that was there. Yeah, and it it uh, it just felt like it resonated with with the scene, and, and uh, so it was as I'm sure all of you are very aware of this process. It was like you know tested as a, as a temp, and then it somehow just like really, really resonated with the, with the scene. So we just decided to let it be. Sometimes the, the temp, and I mentioned this earlier this morning in another lecture, we talked about 2001 A Space Odyssey, and how Kubrick kept his temp in that film instead of the score that was done by, um, uh, I forgot his name, uh, North, help me. Alex North. North. Thank you, Alex North. Um, and what's interesting sort of about those things is sometimes temp almost grows roots you know? Oh my God, yes. And then you <laughs> oh, I know. Yeah. And, you, and it's, a, it's a blessing and a curse. You it know? is, indeed. It is, indeed. And sometimes yeah. you realize that if you have to uproot that temp, yeah. you can do damage. Yes, and and, exactly. and, and, and it, out of pride or out yeah. of, you know, whatever, you move in directions and somehow it never fully satisfies again. And that's tricky. Yeah. And other times, temp is easy to flick away like it's nothing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, definitely. No, this was, all, yeah, this was definitely one of those points where, I mean, there wasn't really a lot of temp in the series because, like, I started quite early in the process. Um, so I was recording, like, as, as they were shooting. So, um, so thankfully, like there wasn't really, and, and it was a very specific sound world, so it wasn't really possible to tap with. Right, right. <laughs> there wasn't really a lot of music the that covered that. No music editor <laughs> wants that job. Here you go, have a good no, time exactly, with it. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. There was, I mean, there were some attempts, but it was just, uh, yeah, it just like none of none of those attempts really worked. So so that was definitely worked in my in, in you know in my favor. But um, but yeah, this this scene somehow just was. Uh, um, you know, it felt like it needed that extra, like, emotional kind of push. Mm -hmm. And you worked on the first Sicario as well. Can you talk a little bit about that process? Yeah. On the first one. On the, the, going yeah. into the second one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, so uh, so Johan Jonsson was the composer of, of the first one. And so Johan, I, uh, you know, met when I was a teenager in Iceland. He's obviously also Icelandic, so we grew up together in Iceland and um, worked together very intensely for about 20 years pretty much every uh, single project that, that both of us did. And um, Sicario was one of those projects. And uh, so I, I played, um, with most of the string parts are uh, in Sicario one are, are played by me or, you know, manipulated by me or, or so. I'm, I'm a quite big part of, of the sound world of, of uh, Sicario one. And uh, when it came to doing the sequel, I was, I was hired as a composer just because it seemed to make a lot of sense since, <laughs> since it seemed like a logical continuation. Um, logical continuation, exactly. And um, uh, yeah, it was it was. Um, uh, I mean, Sicario Two is 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 quite different from one. You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of different elements to the story in, in two from one. So it required quite a different type of score, because Sicario 1 is, um, I mean, there's only 40 minutes of music in that film, so it's like very, um, there's uh, it's like absolutely no underscoring, and it's just like kind of, you know, it, yeah, it's like featured moments, and, and that just like really worked uh, quite well for that film. And That's not the case with Sicario 2, it seems like there's more No, exactly, so Sicario 2 is more, there's the story is a little bit more, you know, there's more, there's, there are more like emotional elements to it, and, and yeah, more yeah, exactly. So so, even though it's not, I mean, I'm not a huge fan of underscoring either, and and so it's not exactly underscoring, but there's a little bit more kind of emotional manipulation, <laughs> I say, in Sicario too, and um, because of the impact of um, the Sicario one, how what a big impact it had on the, the film uh, scoring world and uh, the amounts of times that that, um, specifically the beast, had been copied <laughs> after following You were that. not motivated <laughs> in trying to do another copy. I was not really, like, I felt like enough attempts had been made to try to copy that <laughs> that, that exact track. So, I, 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 no, I didn't feel very motivated to do exactly the same, uh, exactly the same music. But... Um, but obviously, also since I'm, you know, I'm playing most of the uh, the things in one, it, you know, I'm obviously um, recognizing that sound world in, in number two. Um, but just like taking it into a little bit of a different direction. Do you record these things in one session with the full piece of music, or do you actually do it piece by piece and just record different elements? Uh, well, it just um, for for this piece, I recorded the orchestra in Budapest, and um, I recorded most of the elements separately for this, and then and then um, uh, yeah, because there's a, there's a lot of um, I mean the sound was kind of low, so you can't really hear, but there's there was uh, there was um, I did some quite some like spatial experiments with uh, with uh, musicians. Um, as we were recording, so it was kind of it was nice to have every, everything, everyone separate to be able to kind of you know record different ways in the in the space and then and then mix that together. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting in, in watching the film. I remember being very curious what would happen with the music because obviously Johan hadn't done the score, um, and it was one of those things where I was very kind of fascinated by what would happen. What I liked so much about your approach is it felt very different from the original, but at the same time, it felt like it was emanating from the same world. And it felt like we don't have the same lead character. Mm -hmm. We're with a different group, in essence, or, or partly. Mm -hmm. And it seemed like, in many ways, the way the music is operating, it's very textural. Mm -hmm. You have sounds that could be sound effects or elements, but mm -hmm. they're instruments. And as you listen closely, you can hear the contours of them. Mm -hmm. It added a human, a warmer connection to it in many ways that the first one didn't have. Yeah, yeah. No, exactly. I, th I think that was... Exactly, the biggest difference between one and two was the kind of was the the, the um, you know there were much more emotions in, in number two, so I felt like it just it needed a little bit of extra warmth without really getting cheesy, you know, or trying not to get cheesy. At least. <laughs> <laughs> which leads me to Joker, which uh, I'm fortunate enough to have seen uh, the other day, and it is an absolutely stunning masterpiece. I can say that comfortably. Um, your score is such a huge character in it. It feels almost like it's 
It's, it's Todd's vision, and it's what Keen's performance, and it's your score. And everything else is kind of contributing to that element, uh, which really, I, I was very inspired by. It really felt like, um, as a film, you feel like you are lifted into a sort of suspended <coughs> state, and you stay there throughout on that journey. Tell me a little bit about how that project came together. And then yeah, we're... yeah. It was a, a really wonderful project to work on, because um, uh, Todd contacted me, and, and he, like the same with Chernobyl, he knew my work from before, so he knew my records, and, and um, contacted me and asked me if I was interested in reading a script, which I obviously was, and, and, um, and you know, I, I really loved it, so he asked if, if he, um, if I, if I was interested in making some music just based on my feelings of the of the script, and this was probably um, yeah, it must have been like half a year before they started shooting, and um, so I, um, I I you can see how I'm constantly moving my hands. I, I like I experience things very kind of <laughs> physically, <laughs> and as I was saying about the um, reading before, um, you know, I really experience physically, like physical reactions to when I'm reading, because I just, you know, start to see all these things and feel all these things, which I, I'm, I mean, I'm sure everyone else feels feels the same. But Did it, you know it, that Joaquin was going to be playing the lead at that point? Uh, the, it hadn't actually been confirmed, I think, but it was it was very likely that it was going to be him. Um, so I, I read the script and I get this, you know, I, I just had, I had a lot of, um, I really connected to, to, to Arthur and to the Joker and, and um, I'm probably not allowed to say like too much about the, um, the story yet, but um, but I, I I got a really kind of strong connection to um, to his his kind of inner yeah. world and and you know I, I just had a very kind of yeah just like had a lot of um, empathy for <laughs> for him I felt very strongly for him and uh, because Todd. I uh, really liked my solo records, which are largely cello based. Um, I knew that he was, you know, very keen on having a cello as a kind of key um, key role in the score. And that's kind of all the discussions that we had. Like we didn't really talk about anything else, but you know, I just those were kind of the only directions <laughs> as such as I as I had in the beginning. And and um, so I kind of I I went searching for Arthur's music through the cello. Mm -hmm. And um, the cello being, you know, the instrument that I played since I was four years old, I have I have a very strong physical connection, emotional and physical connection to it. So, so I, I um, as I was kind of, you know, searching for for Arthur's musical path, I, you know, I'm kind of playing around to that. As I um, as I kind of stumbled on his on his uh, on his theme, I just I had a really strong physical reaction at this at the same, exact same place as the. As in this, when I read the script, it was like a very strong kind of uh, arm movement and very strong kind of chest connection. So I was like, <gasps> there it is. There it is. That's it. Yeah. That's it. I'm like, wait, 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 wait. Nobody do anything. That's it. Right. Hold, hold the spot. Hold the spot. Hold the spot. Hold the spot. <laughs> and uh, it was just, you know, it's just that obviously it doesn't happen all the time with with uh, music. But it was really, it was like I was being punched in the chest, like when <laughs> when uh, when when I um, when it came. And so I, I, you know, I did some arrangements of, of, of these themes and, and sent it out, and, and he was pretty much, I think, struck with the same, with the same there feeling. Because there, there it is. And he was like, "Hey, wait a minute! How do you, how do you know what this film is supposed to sound like? We haven't even started it." Right. And, and uh, it was so it was like a wonderful dialogue from the from the beginning. But, but we didn't really have to talk about what it was going to be, you know, which is well, you'd found it. You'd yeah, found exactly. It. But it's it's like this, you know. It's for me, I'm not really. I'm not a huge word person. Like music is a much better way for me to express myself than, than words, because I, you know, I just find it hard to explain things, and I, you know, don't remember what, what stuff is called. <laughs> so, so I don't really enjoy talking about music. <laughs> I don't really enjoy talking about ideas, and I, I just, for me, it's it's much more satisfying when you can just feel them and you can just like, you know, just make them. Instead of like spending a lot of time discussing things, I just like I I, I don't really like that so much. Although I love being here talking to you. Guys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, 
Yeah, so it was, it, was just a, it was just a lovely way to start off and just completely, you know, it just felt like we were saying the same story because that, that can often be the, the tricky thing with, with working on film because there's so many people telling a story and it's just so, there's so many ways to tell the same story and it's just so personal what people, you know, how they want to tell the story and, and it was just really clear that we really wanted to tell the same story. And that was just a sort of wonderful place to start. And um, so, yeah, so I had made a lot of, uh, a lot of music when, before they started shooting. And as, as they started shooting, they were playing a lot of that music on set or, or like when, when, um, when Joaquin had like an earpiece. So he was listening to a lot of the music like, well, as, he was, as he was performing. <coughs> and, um, some of the, uh, you can play bathroom, yeah, so um, so this scene that we're going to see here, for example, is he's listening to the to the music. So this is exactly the same music as I um, as I wrote from the start, and he is uh, it's like it's a big kind of turning point for his character, and he is um, yeah he's basically it's it's like he's reacting to he's like he's basically do, like doing a choreography of of. Um, of the music and it was just so because this was one of the first scenes that they sent me after like you know as they were shooting it was just like i hope it's getting this and um it was just magnificent to see that joaquin was physically experiencing exactly the same things as i was experiencing like when i was when i was performing it and it was it was exactly the same kind of types of of movement contortion yes exactly and and there's a lot of like you know physical gestures that are just really the same as, as I had experienced. And, and we never talked about it. Like I actually, I told him this like uh, a week ago. <laughs> and it's just, you know, it's, it's just a wonderful, it was just like uh, creatively for me, it was just like a wonderful um, sense of, of, of connection when you can, when you can to travel this journey and you can create this you can create this piece without any words without ever saying anything about it and and that's for me the most magical way of, of working so when I, I listened to your score before I watched the film and I felt such an emotional empathetic experience I felt that the your score was doing one of two things it was moving inside of the pain of the character and really embodying it and also it was a time maternalistic and, and, and kind and looking down upon that struggle. And that line is sort of what the film does too. You have these moments that you're so lost in his performance, so lost in the immediacy of the moment. And other times you see this broader tragic arc kind of coming through. And what I love so much about this scene is that it's his physicality that becomes his, his, his moment of escape, his moment of freedom. And, and the physicality of Joaquin's performance is so remarkable. I'm just curious a little bit about how you embraced or related to the physicality of the character as you were building. No, that's exact. I mean, that was like the whole. That was like the whole point for me. I just experienced it so physically, and and uh, and it was just so like incredible to see that we were experiencing the same things physically, like me and Joaquin, because it's it's a. Uh, yeah, like I said, we never we never talked about it. It was never mentioned. Like it was never it, it never those words were never floating in the air, you know. So, and um, and I guess it you know it also comes down to the script just being really good. And um, and you know I, I think I think the um, you know the kind of the the, the softer side that, that I was kind of that I was expressing and that I was feeling is is also just like you know why is. Why is no one like seeing him? Like, yeah. why is no one like you know? Which is also just like so I'm, I'm, it's so heartbreaking. It's just like why, why is everybody so mean to him? Like, you know, <laughs> he's such a nice guy. And he wants so badly to connect. Exactly, he's like really trying hard, and it's just that kind of you know, it's, it's this very tra It's like a really tragic story, and and uh, yeah, and, you know, I've just felt important that the music. And again, it's like it's the the, the role of music in, in films is is um, I think is is uh, just so often to 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 
telling this, the, the parts of the story that we can't see on screen. It's like the same with the, with the radioactivity and, and, uh, and Chernobyl. It's like, you know, you can't see radioactivity, so the music can, yeah, exactly. So the music can, can be that. And, and, the, um, and this kind of inner turbulence uh, that he's experiencing, like you, I mean, you can't, you can't touch it, you can't see it, like ex exactly. So you can kind of the music helps with uh, helps with that, and that's what I did also a bit in the in the orchestration of the. We also have the orchestrator of the score here with us today. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, amazing job, and so the the role of the. Um, and the orchestration in the, uh, as it kind of progresses in the film was also kind of uh, tapping a little bit on that because the, the score itself is relatively it's relatively classical for like uh, at least for for a score by me like there's themes you know it's a thematic orchestral score and um, so the themes are you know they're relatively <coughs> simple because he's he's a you know simple character. And, um, the whole story, actually. Yeah, That's exactly. Simplicity. Yes, exactly, exactly. I mean, it's it's really just like it's a story of of like you know a, a simple man like yeah. trying to find <laughs> find his feet, and um, but kind of what makes him so complex is the, like all the all the um, all the baggage that he's carrying and all of this baggage that he doesn't even know exists and all these kind of, you know, demons and darkness that he doesn't even know where it comes from or he doesn't maybe even realize in the beginning that it's there. Um, so I kind of wanted the music to to portray that as well. So so the, the very beginning of the of the film, um, you, you feel like it's only one cello playing, but in reality there's like a... There's like a whole symphony orchestra playing behind, like playing behind the, um, the cello, the almost like yeah, almost like a ghost, so almost like, and you don't really hear it, but you feel the energy of it. Of like a wind. It. Yes, exactly. So, so it's like this, this the orchestra is kind of you know like this invisible, invisible demons and this, this invisible energy that that comes as his kind of as his aggression grows and as he gets kind of more and more frustrated and as he realizes what has happened to him in his in his past and where, where he actually comes from because he doesn't he doesn't really know his 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 uh, actual past and it's as like he's discovering the demons like exactly you know. exactly so the music kind of starts to grow with that and the orchestra kind of comes from which has been kept a bit behind you know it's kind of allowed to kind of really grow and become like this monster that that, um, that, he turns. that he turns into, yeah. So that was kind of the, the orchestral journey of the, of the score. It, it reminds me sort of of, and there's something very beautiful when you read a script that's really powerful and you recognize the basic foundational component. And sometimes it's very simple. Sometimes it's really two notes or it's just one foundational emotion that you know that you have to find a way to carry through. And it seems like this is a good example of a film that has real direction of purpose, you know, from the script level, from the structure of the film, and from obviously Joaquin's performance and, and your music, they feel so aligned. They feel so, the, 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 they're not on divergent paths. They're all finding and discovering the same thing at the same time. And I feel like in a way, the more organic nature of it, the more empathetic nature of it really allows us to go deeper into where he is and to fill in all the space. And he's giving you so much already that when you add that further element into it, it just is kind of an emotionally devastating experience, which makes the ending almost more cathartic and terrible. And I'm curious how you feel. We don't want to give away the ending, but how did you feel that you were working out the emotional ending of that film? Because it's, it's a very, I still don't quite know what to make of that whole last sequence, if that makes sense. <laughs> I've been thinking about it since I saw it. Yeah, I... yeah, yeah. Um, I don't really know how to explain that without giving away. Yeah, I know, I know. I'm, <laughs> I'm just like, <laughs> Just imagine that I said something really deep and. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, we have obviously just a little bit more time. Why don't we take some questions from the audience? Anyone have a question? Or are you just gobsmacked by the experience? Of <laughs> yes. Hi. Uh, Hi. I know you're. Uh, approach to uh, writing music to every film obviously uh, varies, but uh, are there certain techniques or ways that you 
um, start to discover the music for film that you go to or that you use as sort of your own tools whenever you're starting to create uh, musical notes for, for a score? Um, no, not really. I mean, I really just try to uh, be as open as possible to the project and what the project needs or what the story needs um, um, as possible when I start. So I try to, it's the same with that kind of um, genre boxes that I was talking about before. It's like, if, I feel like if I, if I, as soon as I have a method, I feel it, like it kind of, it's a, it's a, it's a restraint on, on me. So I just, um, yeah, I try not to have a method, no. Hi, um, you probably get tired of answering this question, but you know, music doesn't have a gender. Why are, do you think there are so few female composers working in, in Hollywood today? Yeah, shit, I don't know, man. <laughs> it's, a, it's a true mystery to me. It's, a, it's really one of the, the biggest mysteries of life to me because, because music, like, you know, you don't really need to do any heavy lifting, unless you're a cellist, and obviously, you know, women could do that too, so... <laughs> you fix that problem. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's all with the brain. Um, no, I, I really don't know, you know, it's just, it's just, um, um, I think I, I yeah, I, I really don't have an answer to that. I mean, I guess it's just, it's one of those things that, like, traditionally, you know, it's just like, um, like why is it why is it like mostly men that are taxi drivers? You know, women can also drive cars. It's just like I guess like traditionally it's like men that drive taxis and therefore, you know, women don't really think of it as an option. You know, or, or you know, I think that might be one of the problems. Um, I haven't really myself experienced um, not being included because I'm a woman. You know, so I I. I um, I don't know if that's the, I mean, I know that, that there are women that have definitely experienced that, and I, I guess I'm also, um, I'm a little bit like outside of the kind of industry of it, so so I don't really know how the industry works. I don't really know what it is to be like inside of this bubble that's that's happening here, so, I, um, so that might be one of the restrictive reasons. But my take on it has, has just um, has just been to um, to not let that um, um, restrict me in any way. And I, I am, I'm just fortunate enough to have like I had really strong female role models in my life and, and my grandmother is, is uh, probably the biggest one and she was uh, one of the first doctors in Iceland. She was um, which is also like a very male dominated world and she um, managed to like single-handedly on her pension to uh, make a vaccine. She, she was a viro virologist and she made a vaccine um, that uh, was basically the, um, there was the same virus as AIDS and she did that alone funding it with her pension, you know, she just like walked on the bus to... Fuck it, I'm just doing it myself. No one else is doing it, I'm doing it myself. <laughs> so, so that's kind of what I, was, what I was raised with and that's kind of how I just always like, you know, I want to do music and, and if there's no other women doing it, like, that's... I think if you win an Emmy tomorrow, there's going to be 18 times as many female composers because once you see somebody... Yeah, exactly. Forward, that's, that's it reminds exactly. Exactly. No, absolutely. absolutely. I, think it's, I think it's just... I think we just have to break the... break, break this... Um, Fixed stereotypes. Yeah, the, the stereotype, you know, I, th I think we should just, you know... They're meaningless and ultimately their habits. Yeah, habits. Exactly, exactly. I mean, there's no, there's no, um, there's no reason why women shouldn't do music, you know. Music is completely genderless and, and you know, I think the more, you know, the role of music in, in film is just to, you know, it's, it's it, to... To you know, to be emotional, like to, to show emo like an emotional side of, of of stories, and I think you know, the more voices you have, like you know, in in that role, the better. So I think we should obviously just you know include every voice, and you know, I think it's just gonna it's just gonna benefit the whole um, you know film music so much.
Super, uh, great uh, details on your work. Um, I actually want to know a little bit more about, you know, you came from a relatively unconventional film scoring background, if I may say, mm -hmm. um, and there is a, a certain organicness about that. Um, how are you balancing your record career and albums, which I believe you love, and that's where your, perhaps your heart is, mm -hmm. with the stress of dealing with the executives of a studio and timeline and crunch and creative freedom. And an extension of that question, if I may, um, were you given the freedom to take the music the way you wish um, and record with whoever you want? Uh, specifically interested about the previous film, which is so obviously being a major motion picture. And were you, yeah, yeah. Were, were you restricted to use certain orchestras, uh, records at certain location? Uh, I'm sure you would appreciate the, ta the influence of tax incentives these days within film scoring. Yes. <laughs> so I'd love to know how you're balancing the stress of that, from the, that and also how did you find working on a, a studio level film and whether or not you had that creative say at or not? Mm -hmm. like, yeah, try to remove all that. I was going to say this is so, so, part A through six. <laughs> <laughs> so one is the, the, the balancing of the records and the, yeah. <clears throat> well, um, I haven't, well, I've, I've mostly, the last few years, I've, I've mostly been focusing on film just because it's, um, it's kind of just accidentally turned out that way. And um, uh, I think I'm probably going to take a little break now because I've had a pretty you know, long film streak and, and not wanting to get stuck anywhere. I'm probably going <laughs> to move somewhere else and do, probably uh, hopefully do a record. Um, <clears throat> so I guess I'm still trying to figure out the answer to that question myself. So I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I'm, uh, even though I've I've uh, mostly been doing films the last years, I'm I'm um, I definitely promise you that I'm, I won't only be doing that. <laughs> That's a sacred promise. Um, for the freedom, um, of freedom of yes, yeah, exactly. No, I mean, yeah, studio films definitely are kind of uh, location restricted, and um, tax definitely plays a role in that. So. So I didn't have like a whole bunch of options to choose from, like which orchestra to use and stuff like that, because of like union rules. But I obviously have, you know, I, I performed a large part of the score myself, which was um, easily accessible. <laughs> and <laughs> and, um, uh, and I, of course, have, I have my, my team that I work with in Berlin, you know, like Sam again, who, who uh, we're in the same. Yeah, you can get an applause. <laughs> And um, uh, so yeah, so so kind of the, the ground the groundwork was done, you know, by me and and, um, and in, in, in our studio and by us in, in Berlin. And then when it came to the orchestra part, it, it was a little bit um, scary because I had to go outside of you know my. Nerd. I'm like I'm quite funny with. Um, uh, uh, I see like musicians and and um, people that I work with. I it's it's much more based on like a personal level than a, an actual, you know, musician level. So sometimes you know it it, it kind of matters more to me that I have a strong personal connection with the people that I'm working with than you know actually what instrument they're playing or you know if they're any good. You know, it's it's a. Uh, so I tend to work mostly with, you know, my family or people that I worked with for, you know, at least 20 years before. <laughs> no, so, so that, that's exactly the point that I was coming to. It, it, it was a little bit scary to me, the, the orchestra part, when I realized that I couldn't do it with the people that I'd worked with before, because I had to do it in either LA or New York. So uh, I took a great chance, which I don't regret, and worked with the wonderful Jeff and Nadia, <laughs> because... <laughs> <laughs> because uh, you know we didn't know each other from before, so he conducted the score as well, and uh, and but we you know we became best friends since, since then. So it was a, it was a great leap of faith, and that um, uh, and I'm really grateful for that. So so we recorded in um, in New York, 
with mostly um, the New York film um, musicians from the New York film, but also like a handful of people that I knew really well in New York. So I, I felt a little bit more at home in New York than than here, for example, because I'm not used to recording here, so I don't know so many people that, that work here. So that was the result. Uh, no, okay, good. <laughs> you have other questions? Hi. Hello. Hi. Oh, hello. Um, thank you so much for being here. Um, you mentioned earlier about how there was a ghost of an orchestra behind the cello. So are you saying that you recorded a cellist in front of the New York Philharmonic and you can't hear the New York Philharmonic playing behind that cellist? Yes. Wow, <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> yeah, no. So, so the cello in front—that's um, um, that's me, because that was again easily accessible. And uh, but I recorded that in Berlin. So, like for example, the track that you heard the beginning of the second track that you heard the beginning of <laughs> was uh, uh, was me playing, and you, you could mostly hear me. But there is actually the New York film part of it is is actually playing as well and that was um, one of the biggest challenges of, of this recording session as, as uh, Jeff can uh, tell us all about uh, was the kind of uh, the energy of you know the, the, the incredible restraint that they often had to have in the recording and the incredible like you know quietness that they that they have to with which they had to perform and um, uh, it's it's it was like a really interesting recording process because they did such an amazing job and the recordings were so, like some of the sessions were like so intense because um i really feel really strongly about like the energy of of a performance you know because when you're recording it is a you know it is a performance and the energy in the room of which you're performing and it's like you know it's half of the performance basically and that really often the energy in the in the room as we were recording was just like really intense and, and um, I hope you feel that in the, in the music when you get to hear the rest of that the piece. By the way, I really recommend seeing the film in the theater. I mean, yes. it is a really extraordinary experience to see in the theater. So those of you who are waiting for it to come up on Netflix, don't, don't do that. Do uh, you have any other questions? Just on the intensity part, because every time I would watch Chernobyl, I would go to sleep like, you know, like just so negative and dark, like so scary. I'm sorry. No, no, no. I mean, in a good way. I was just like blown away. You know, but she'll give you a hug after. Yeah. <laughs> Going away, uh, like how do you, how do you deal with that intensity and that emotion? Do you when you're recording something like that? Uh, do you internalize it? Do you release it? And how does that work? Well, that's a really good question. I mean, it's. Um, um, it it can be really intense. I mean, the the these subjects are are not easy subjects, and um, and I'm someone that that like I really go really far into what I'm working on, and maybe sometimes a little bit too far, so I can, you know, take take a bit of a of a toll. But um, for some reason, I mean, now that you you've seen me and you know me, I'm a, I'm a relatively like you know cheerful person and you know I, I love saying yeah she's exactly. so fun and like hearted and then these pieces are so like yeah intense. exactly exactly but that but that has somehow always um it kind of my musical side has has always been much darker than my personality that I am in in, in like day to day life and I think you know every person has like a, a darker side and a, and a lighter side and um I guess my darker side just comes out stronger in the in the music, so I have like more space to be, you know, have fun, you know, in my. <laughs> in my it's in a my better balance than the opposite, right? Yes, exactly. So hopefully, it's it's you know it's easier on my family life than you know if, if that side had to come out in the kitchen, you know, it would be kind of. <laughs> you know, no one would uh, no one would like that. <laughs> but I, you know, I tried to. I think it's really important to um, to have a, have a good balance between your work life and and your personal life as well. And I think it's uh, like um, I really try to uh, to take a lot of time to just you know 
take care of myself as well. So I, you know, I, I, I you know, I meditate a lot, and I, you know, I, I really, I take a lot of. I just, I try to take as much care of myself as I can because the, this, this industry can, you know, it can be a bit tough on you and takes a, you know, it's a lot of, lot of stress that comes with it, and, and I think. Uh, you know, the, the the more aware of you know your um, uh, work life balance. Yeah, your work life balance. The, the 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 better you can kind of just you know go go home and and uh, you know take your seven year old to a soccer practice and and just be focusing on you know how well he's doing in the soccer practice, <laughs> not like how many people you saw die at work, you know. <laughs> And on that note, <laughs> can we have a round of applause?